Okay, this is another one of those videos where I've been sitting here for three hours shooting and deleting and shooting and deleting footage, all right? It's like, I don't know, it's like 95 degrees here in Vienna. I got no pants on. I'm sitting here balls out shooting this video, sweating like a dog. The reason it's complicated is because there are a variety of ways to approach this extremely broad, deep, complex, rich, potentially problematic topic of substances, plant medicine, hallucinogens, drugs. So I wanna talk about substances from the perspective of a former full-time Zen monk who's done a lot of meditation and a decent amount of drugs. Once upon a time, many moons ago, I graduated from a very Catholic college. I was inexperienced in the ways of life. I wanted to be a writer. Writers are experienced in the Jimi Hendrixian sense. They do drugs, I thought at the time. So I moved to Los Angeles to become a screenwriter and I started experimenting with drugs. And I wanna kinda of take you through that journey a little bit we're going to end that journey not too long ago in the middle of the Amazon jungle with a Peruvian ayahuascaro. We're going there, but I wanna take you along a little bit of a journey first because not all drugs are equal. And what I wanna do in this video is, what do I wanna do in this video? Let's review the drugs I took. Pot. Smoked it, ate it, vaped it. In my experience, marijuana always overpromises and under delivers. Acid, LSD, took it twice. I don't remember much about this experience. I felt like my mind was turning into rust at the time. The walls were melting a little bit. People sing acid's praises, but it didn't do much for me. Meth. Never done meth, never will. Don't do meth. Vicodin, mother's little helper. It just kind of makes everything a little bit fuzzy and fizzy and nice. And after a while you realize, wow, I'm sleepwalking through my life. That's opiates, stay away. Cocaine, the first time I ever did cocaine, I only did it twice, was with this neighbor and he was on disability and he's where these guys talk like this. And he had this big mustache and he always wore baseball caps on backwards and he walked around in his shorts, no t-shirt, thin arms, huge belly. One day he had me over to his house for swordfish, right? And he got this little baggie of white powder and he said, you wanna try some cocaine? I thought, all right, I've never done it before, let's try it. So I took a toot of this cocaine and the very first thought that I had was, this feels amazing. And the very second thought I had was, I want more. And that was a good lesson. Cocaine was a pure ego drug. Ecstasy, took it at a gay club with my friend Josh and his boyfriend Dan. We're up on like a platform overlooking the dance floor and the ecstasy kicks in. And I remember thinking, right when it began to come on. It really was a feeling of total bliss and total ecstasy. And I had a inner experience that I'll never forget that was very important. And that experience was, wow, I thought. If, if it's even humanly possible to experience what I'm experiencing right now, then this is not a fundamentally bad universe. Even if this is a chemical alteration in my brain that's making me feel a certain way and it's tricking me, I don't care. Because if this is, if just if this is possible, this cannot be a wholly bad universe. So a lot of us keep using drugs to have these kinds of experiences. We get a taste of something bigger than ourselves. We get a taste of the egoless state. We get a 
bird's eye view of how our minds work, how our, our brains put together and present to us reality. Let's talk about mushrooms. First experience with mushrooms, I... We Okay, basically, I'm going to save you some time here. I took the mushrooms. I was in West Hollywood living there at the time, and I walked to the dog park. So I walked to the dog park, and everything is getting brighter and softer. This little oasis in the middle of West Hollywood, and I went and I sat down at the base of this tree. And I remember just reaching out. And I was tree hugging. I reached out, and I touched the tree, and I could feel the life inside the tree. I could feel a kind of energy, a life, a, a personality, a character, a being, okay? I mean, I wasn't communicating with it. It wasn't like a crazy experience. It was a very deep, rich tuning in with the type of life that was inside that tree. So I'm telling you these stories about drugs within a personal context, right? But the broader societal context is shifting around the question of substances right now, specifically hallucinogens like mushrooms. So some of you know the uh, nature writer Michael Pollan. He wrote a book that's getting made into a Netflix series. It was a New York Times number one bestseller. It's called How to Change Your Mind. And he talks a lot about how the medical industry is beginning to look at a substance like psilocybin, which is the psychoactive ingredient in mushrooms to treat people with depression. So Michael Pollan talks about how they gave a bunch of people psilocybin and they put them in an MRI machine, which, wow, I would not be want to be on psilocybin. Actually, it might have been acid. I would not want to be getting an MRI on acid or psilocybin. But in any event, what they noticed was that the brain lights up a certain way when a person is not on these substances but it lights up in a completely different way when people are on these substances. And so literally, you are having a rewired experience of your brain when you're on psilocybin. You see the world totally anew. That was my experience of it. You have an afternoon where you have a total break, a trip. You have a trip away from your conventional mind. That's my experience. The, the problem is, or the reason that I don't do mushrooms all the time is because eventually you have to come back to reality sooner or later. So all the psilocybin does is give me a break from conventional reality and that allows me to see things differently. And that's a totally profound experience. But what I learned when I was living in Hollywood was that meditation was, a, was, a, was like my lodestar. It was my north star. It helped me live in a deeper, more connected way with reality as opposed to experiencing a different type of reality which is what mushrooms allowed me to do. So I did not pursue drugs, I pursued meditation. Meditate, 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 meditate. I moved to a Zen Buddhist monastery, lived there 13 years. The lifestyle was extremely strict. I mean, we had coffee, I think, twice a week for breakfast. Uh, occasionally we would drink some sake. Nicotine was involved here and there in the lifestyle. Don't think I ever smoked any pot, never did any mushrooms, any psychedelics or anything like that. It's a pretty the damn clean lifestyle at the Rinzai Zen Buddhist Monastery. I came to the end of my 13 year run there and I wanted to try ayahuasca. So I was visiting a friend here in Vienna and he knew of this shaman who had studied in Peru and he was having a, a journey, an ayahuasca journey at his apartment. So the day of the ayahuasca journey comes and the shaman, there were three shaman sat sitting in front of us. And they've got all these plants in the room and they've got this tobacco and they've got this tobacco water. They've got all these écoutrements of shamanistic stuff. And the whole time I'm not taking any of this serious. I'm just gonna think, give me the ayahuasca, please. So finally they gave us the ayahuasca 
Nothing happens for about 35 minutes. Then suddenly the shamans turn out the light and they start singing and dancing. And holy crap. This was of a completely different order than any other substance I had ever partaken in. We had beside us on our mats, we each had a personal yoga mat, beside us were buckets. These were purge buckets. I took my purge bucket and I looked down into it and the bottom of the bucket completely disappeared and I was looking into infinite hell. Infinite hell. And what that hell was, was infinite ego. And I vomited and I vomited and I vomited. It was one of the most difficult experiences of my life. But me being the kind of person I am, I wanted to do it again. So I eventually left the monastery. I got together with my girlfriend and we booked a flight a few months later to Peru to hang out with a shaman on the Amazon. We would do one night on, one night off, one night on, one night off, one night on. Three nights total, seven day ayahuasca retreat. So I wanna tell you about the three nights I had on ayahuasca. Then we're gonna summarize all of his drug experiences and come to some kind of conclusions here, okay? We're in the Amazon, night is setting. We're literally in the middle of nowhere, okay? There are all these animal sounds. We begin the ceremony with the shaman. I take the ayahuasca, right? And about 30 minutes in, the shaman start chanting. And this is when it got trippy. Now, I am saying that this is, this is what the experience was. So I had the experience of the presence of, of another being. I, ex I had this experience of a woman in front of me, but she was pure black. She was made out of shadow, okay? This is when the experience r really started to kick in at the beginning. And there were two of these shadow women and they had these long black hair and they were doing this dance. They were doing this and it was pure black, these black faces, just a shadow, right? Dancing in front of me. And I'm telling you, it felt like, oh my God, there's something here. They're in front of me. And they were beckoning me to come for beckoning me. And I remember thinking like, I could go, but I just don't have the courage. So I didn't follow the shadow women into the parallel dimension. What I did do was once again, purge. I vomited and vomited and vomited. I held on to the end of the porch and I just vomited. And they talk about this in ayahuasca circles. They talk about purging up what you need to purge, letting it go, cleaning yourself out. I had a lot of cleaning to do. I'm not sure what that was all about, but I had a lot of cleaning to do. So by the end of the night, I finally was getting sober six hours later. And I remember thinking, ayahuasca is a dominatrix with stiletto heels. And she has had her sharp stiletto heels to my throat for the last six hours. I will never spend time with this <laughs> again. I was done with ayahuasca. So I thought I'll just hang out in the Amazon now with my girlfriend. I'll stay here for the rest of the retreat, but I will not do ayahuasca. The next day we had a day off. That night I had this really interesting, intense dream. I, it's hard to describe, but I was, I was at a party and it was the 1980s and there was an actress from the 1980s. She was Marty McFly's girlfriend in Back to the Future, don't remember her name. She was standing at the bar at this party and she called me over and she said, what you went through that first night with ayahuasca, don't worry. The experience, that was just the first night. The experience is gonna get better. 
That was just the introduction, but this is actually a, a three-part journey and it's going to get interesting. You might want to stick around for that. I woke up and I thought, okay, I'm going to do the second trip. So the second night, sure enough, completely different experience. When you take ayahuasca, when you go on a journey like this, you're supposed to have an intention, right? Set and setting or mindset, what you're bringing to the experience and the setting, where you're doing it, who you're doing it with, these are important things. So part of the mindset of an ayahuasca journey is your intention. And my, injure, my intention that I brought to this journey was some clarity on how to tell a story. I was working on a fiction project then, still am actually, and I wanted to know how to do it. I've never successfully written fiction before. I wanted to know how do you tell a story to people. And once I went through the initial part of this second ayahuasca journey, it was like I came out in, in, in the stars is what it felt like. And, and the stars, as I stared at them, they took the shape of a huge cabinet in the sky. And the cabinet swung open. It was like the universe, the, 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 our solar system opened up a door in front of me up in the sky. And the night, Peruvian night sky was above me. And it was very bright with many stars. And this door swung open and this voice came and it said, play. Very easy. That's how you do fiction. You play. And within this ca cabinet of wonders that opened up in the, our solar system of a night sky, there were all these beautiful ideas and bright, shiny objects and plot lines and characters. It was all this stuff. And it was like my toy chest. And the message was play. I also had the intention to work through some, some family issues that I had, healing around these issues. And I remember seeing generations of men in my family, my brothers, my dad, my grandpa, seeing all of us and, and, and feeling their, our hearts and our characters. And I remember looking at my brother in my mind and seeing him taking over the family business and feeling his innocence. And this message came to me, you, you Hobner men, you care too much. You care too much. So I had some healing around family issues. So that was it. The retreat ended and my girlfriend and I went to the city of Iquitos which is on the Amazon. And there's like an open market there where, they, where there are little vending stalls and they sell all kinds of curios, right? So here's how I'm gonna close my ayahuasca journey story. My, this is like two weeks after the ayahuasca retreat. My girlfriend and I are kind of in this shopping, outdoor shopping area with the different stalls, right? We're going from stall to stall. I come to this one stall and my jaw hits the ground and it's it's an it's an uh, local artists put their artwork there and a lot of it is ayahuasca inspired and there is a big statue like this big right and it's a woman solid black no face flowing black hair looks like a pure shadow identical to the one I had seen on my journey two weeks earlier. Remember the very first day I did ayahuasca? Those two women appeared before me. They were like shadows. They were like a doorway. They were pure shadows with no face flowing by. This guy had a statue of this exact same figure in his artist shop. And I'm like, first of all, can I take a picture of that? And he's like, First of all, no, you can't, you gotta buy it. It's that kind of a place. So I said, okay, what is this thing? And he said, oh, that's, that's I had some name for it, but he's like, people see that spirit on their ayahuasca journeys. That's the, one of the spirits of this region of the Amazon. So we started with pot. 
We went to cocaine, we tried some mushrooms, we did some ecstasy, we took some Vicodin, we wound up in the Amazon on an ayahuasca journey. We've had all kinds of altered states of consciousness today here in this video. What are some conclusions that we can draw? Well, for one thing, we don't put in Zen too much stock in these experiences. So I felt really grateful to have been able to go to the Amazon and experience not just an altered state of consciousness, it was really to, to experience an altered reality. But it's no more profound, and I should be no more grateful having that experience than I am ha grateful for having the experience of watching a beautiful sunset, or even just walking down the street staring at the ground. This is really important. It's not out there the answers. They're not, you ain't gonna find it in a pill of any kind. And that's the biggest trap with drugs because the, the experience can be so mind altering that if you don't have a ton of meditation under your belt, it can really make you think that that the next time you take the drug, you're gonna finally get the answer. And I don't, in my experience, that's not what happens. In my experience, the next time you, whether it's mushrooms or ayahuasca, the next time you do it, you kind of get the same message. And then you get the same message. And then, you know, it's time for you to move on. So in, in Zen, we don't privilege certain experiences or certain states of mind over other experiences or other states of mind through meditation and chanting, various rituals, lighting incense, doing formal meals, or just sitting quietly and breathing, we make relationship with the present moment. We experience reality as it is. We watch and see our thoughts come and go, and at some point, all experience or sense of self, ego, dissolves and is gone, right? It's not that we have amazing, profound, altered states of consciousness on the cushion. We have no consciousness, no mind. And this is the point of meditation. This is the point of Zazen, to dissolve the ego, to dissolve that thinking mind, to dissolve the mind that keeps grasping for answers, grasping for altered states of mind, grasping for different realities, grasping for truth, grasping, grasping, grasping. Tanha, the second noble truth, the cause of suffering is this craving. And we can crave everything from drugs, like cocaine, to ecstasy, like the pill or the experience, to profound spiritual truths, like the ones we can get a glimpse of or taste through ayahuasca journeys or mushroom journeys. So my ultimate conclusion when it comes to substances, drugs, plant medicine, ayahuasca mushrooms, basically, Forget everything. You don't need these things. As I've said before, you got lungs to breathe through and an ass to sit on. That's all you need for the perfectly complete spiritual life. Just sitting, it's all you need. I don't know why I thought it'd be a good idea to make like a 30 minute video about drug experiences, but I'll never talk about this stuff again. So. That's why I did it this time. I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoy the stuff on this channel and you wanna support the work that I do here, I'm increasingly making my living through Patreon and people throwing a tip in my monk's bowl on PayPal. So I'm gonna put the links for Patreon and PayPal in the video description below. It's really hot here. I'm still in my underwear, I'm not wearing shorts. I'm gonna go take a super cold shower. While I do that, why don't you hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the notifications button, and then I will send you good juju while I'm soaking in that nice cold shower. Bye-bye, friends.